Good morning. This is June 4th. We're at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Barbara Slavin. We're interviewing Mr. Fred Grasso for our Veterans Oral History Project. Good morning, Mr. Grasso. Good morning. Could you tell me uh, what your address is? In, Framingham. And may I ask Mass. your Mass. And may I ask your age? Uh, 79. Wow, you look good. <laughs> and your current uh, marital status? Yes, one son. One son. Okay, and you're married? Yes. Okay. Any grandchildren? No. Okay. Where were you born? Needham, Massachusetts. Can you tell me what it was like growing up in Needham? Well, in them days, it was great, good. Everybody was friend. We all got along, no problems. We had a good childhood, believe me. And what was your family background? My mother and father both come from Italy. Mm -hmm. And we were all born in Needham, Mass, my brothers and I. And my sister. It my, went, when and where did you enter the military? I got drafted October the 22nd, 1942. Mm -hmm. And which branch did you join? I was in the United States Army. Do you, could you tell me why you chose that branch? That's where they put me. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Camp Devons, that's where they sent me. Right. So you were drafted? States. Yes, yeah. I was drafted. Did any of your friends or family join the military? Both my brothers were in the service. Yeah. My oldest brother's in before me, February of 42. I went in March, I mean, um, October, and my younger brother went in right after we did. Yeah. The three of us at the same time in the service, Great. different places, all Army. Yeah. My older brother's up in Anzio. Oh. My younger brother's in Normandy, they both get wounded. I was over in the Battle of the Bulge, but I did not get wounded. Oh, they, lucky. I was lucky. Yeah. Where were you sent for basic training? Uh, went to Camp Devons, then from there, we went to Texas, California, and over, over in Europe. Mm -hmm. After that, we, I spent 22 months in the United States and 16 months in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. What was basic training like? It was good. We learned a lot, we did a lot, and of course you get basic training. They tell you when to eat, what, what to eat, when to walk, how to walk, and they train you good, mm -hmm. and the discipline was good, and that was it. That's, we learned a lot, believe me. It was something we never had in our life, and that was something. Mm -hmm. Did you develop any close friends in basic training? Oh, I made a lot of friends in my office. Yes, yeah. I did. We all yeah. got together. We, we lived together all oh, for 38 and a half months. <laughs> what else? <laughs> all nice guys. What did you do when you weren't training? Well, went out and had some fun. Yeah. Enjoyed ourselves, whatever. What else, what else could you do? Did you receive any advanced or specialized training? No. No, we had uh, all the training that was supposed to be done during the, during the war and everything else. Mm -hmm. what, was your, what would you say your specialty was uh, when you got out of training? Uh, what, how would you describe your skills? Well, I'll tell you one thing. When you come out of basic training, you learned a lot, you went to every place, you seen everything, you did everything. Because mm -hmm. you were in the Army and right. you had no choice. But follow their regulations and rules. That's it, period. And what was your rank? I was a Private first class. Private first class. Yes. Did the military uh, prepare you for the cultural differences you would be facing? Uh, uh, people from non-Italian families, whatever, getting along with them? Well, they, we had classes in schools in the yeah. Army. And they right. filled us in and everything. Anything you want to know, they told us. And where was your first duty station? You mean during the war? Uh, Oh, no. Yes, Over yeah, your Europe? first, oh, yeah. We went to England first. England, and what did you do there? We just, right there, we stayed there for a few months, then we went to France, mm -hmm. Germany, Luxembourg, Austria, we went to six, about six countries. We, had, we went, we were heading for Bastogne, the Belle of the Bulge. Okay. Once we went over the channel, we went to France, then we left there to go to Bastogne. And tell me what you did in England. Oh, uh, just 
But we just sat around, trained, and mm -hmm. enjoyed ourselves. What else? What else yeah. did it do in the service? You <laughs> and know? how about France? Was your next stop? We landed in France from England. And when you say Head, landed, do you mean you no, we went over the English Channel. We took the boat over the English Channel. We landed in France. And when was that? Uh, 40, 45. Okay. We're on our way to Bastogne mm -hmm. from France. And what was your landing in France like? Well, the same as they always do. You just get off the boat, and get, you know, in the service, and you right. put you on the truck, and yeah. there you go. And what happened next? We went to Bastogne. Mm -hmm. And what happened there? Well, the 101st Airborne were trapped in the Battle of the Bulge. We were one of the outfits that got them out. And then after that, we went to the Rhine River. And then from the Rhine River, we went up on Austria, Linz, Austria. When the war ended, we liberated that concentration camp in Linz, Austria. I think it was May 8th, I believe it was, okay. 1945. Could you tell me a little 40. bit about liberating the 101st, 101st Airborne, what, what that was like? They were trapped, mm -hmm. and uh, they lost a lot of soldiers, in there, right. and there was a terrible war. That was terrible. It's one of the worst ones they had in the country, in the United States, and for that matter. And there were a lot of outfits in there. We were one of them. And uh, we had to go after them, get them out, which we did. You know, and they went, oh, they, a lot of soldiers got killed in that there. A lot of soldiers got killed in that there. But we finally opened the gates for them and got them out. And it was in the winter time, Christmas Eve, we were there. And Christmas, snow was deep, and, and you had a the elements were bad, and the snow and everything else. But what could you do? It's, it's war, it's war, it's war, period. Right. Well, we finally got them loose, and uh, they moved to the Rhine River, and we had another problem down there, too. What did you do in the Rhine River? We were heading for Austria. Right. You know, we were there for a while, and we got shot at and bombed and strafed and you name it, we would throw it. And, then we finally went up on Austria and the war ended. What, Salzburg. What was your combat like, for example, when you were liberating the 101st Airborne or were you on the, on the Rhine? What was the day-to-day -day combat like? Well, see, I was an outfit. We, we supplied the soldiers in the front. That was our job. Mm -hmm. took them the, the, we took them the, everything that they needed during the war while they were fighting. We were the ones the service, all the supplies to them. And did you drive a truck? We drove a truck right. and, you know, and had a little bit of that because we were almost in the middle of it too. But hey, what are you gonna do? That was our job. But as a truck driver, did you have to engage in combat from time to time? No, no, we just delivered all the mm -hmm. stuff, see. In fact, General Patton rode, rode right by us. Oh, what was uh, that like? Tell me about that. Oh, I was, <laughs> I was up in, in Bastogne on, yeah. on the road there one day and. I see this jeep coming by, and I looked up. I was in 15 feet from him, and he drove right by me, and <laughs> I was I was in awe. You know, it was General Patton. My God, I says, old blood and guts himself. <laughs> in fact, I was so surprised to see him, I forgot to salute him. Oh. <laughs> Believe it or not, I forgot to salute him. And he was, oh, he was quite a guy. He was quite a guy. <laughs> I hope he understood and didn't court martial you. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, was, I was so surprised. I mean, whoever, whoever thought you could see him? Right. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> one of those things. Uh, he was a big shot in the third army, and that was it. <laughs> oh, he was something. Tell me yeah. about the, your activities in the Rhine River. Well, what did you do there? Well, we had to stay uh, overnight a couple of days. We were on our way to Austria. Right. And we stayed there. And... Uh, why we stayed there, it was right where the, the bridge with the, the bridge they built there, over the Rhine, and we got strafed and bombed and shelled and everything mm -hmm. with the planes. It's, it's like everything else. You know, it's, you're in the war, you're in the war. Mm -hmm. And because uh, every time we stopped, we had to dig a hole and stay in our hole. Mm -hmm. that's, you know, there's a, a, a little trench like we had. A, that's, where, that's where we did it every time we stopped. In case something happened, we had to jump in a hole. That's, you know, a slit trench, see? And uh, I had a funny experience when I was down there. They were strafing the area, and we had a school teacher. He got shot. He got a bullet in his rectum. Oh. And this other guy beside me, one of the trucks was on fire, which carried over 100 rounds of ammunition for the tanks, which we were supposed to deliver them, see? And uh, 
he gets out of the trench we were in and jumps in the truck and putting the fire out there. 105 hours of ammunition, there's big shells that go in the truck. Right? And he's putting the fire out and I'm yelling, get off the truck, get off the truck, it's gonna blow, it's gonna blow. He, he ran out of stuff in the, in the, the, the fire extinguisher, see? And he yelling to me, I'm yelling at him to get off the truck, and he yelling to me, bring me another one, bring me another one. <laughs> oh, he, he drove me crazy. So I finally got him another one, brought it to him. He put the fire out. They gave him the Bronze Star for it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, son of a gun, I saved your life and you got the Bronze Star. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Oh, God. <laughs> are, was, you, are you wait, still wait, in touch with him? No, no. I'm not. Because when you're young, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're not, when you're young, you're not, afraid, you're not afraid as much as you are when you get older. I was going to ask you, uh, no. you, don't, you, when you talk about it, you don't seem as though you were that afraid then. Well, it's something we never went through, it and, and, and you had to do it, and you had to be there. Well, of course, we were scared a lot of times, but what are you going to do? War is war. Mm -hmm. And then they passed a law, I guess, that if you're 38 years old, they, they discharge you, mm -hmm. if you're in the service, you know. Mm -hmm. But we were one of the young ones. We were all 20, 21, 22 years old, you know. We, we never had that kind of a problem before, but... When you're in the service, you were trained for it. You had to expect it, mm -hmm. and we went through it. And it was, it was scary, but what are you gonna do? Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. Now right? tell, tell me what happened after the Rhine River. We went to Austria. Yeah. And once we got, then the war ended, I, think, I believe it was May 8th, and we hit this concentration camp in Mauthausen. And we were the first ones to open the gates for those people. Would you repeat the name of the concentration camp? Mauthausen. Mm -hmm. It's a well, brand new camp. Eichmann was in charge and, of that. And when was that? In May of uh, 40, 45. Okay. And mm -hmm. could you tell me what that was like, the camp? Oh, I was never so sick in all my life. They had women, men, women, kids in there, see? And all the Jews wore the different type of uniforms. They had them, the black and white with the stripes on them. That's how they separated the Jews from everybody else. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the people wore whatever clothes they had. And I met this Italian guy, there's the steps going up to a, up on the top little hill, like all the big offices and buildings were. And I met this Italian guy halfway down the steps and I don't think he weighed 90 pounds. He was in the camp and he told me, of course in them days, if you hit a Jewish family during the war, mm -hmm. you went to camp with them. Mm -hmm. You weren't supposed to do that, see? Mm -hmm. But I talked to this Italian guy, because I can speak a little Italian, and asked him what happened. He told me, he says, they took his mother and father over here and his brother and sister over here. He says, they shot my mother and father, and they shot my brother and sister. But they were too old to work, and my brothers were too young to work. They kept me, because I had to go to work. He says, you know, and he says to me, he says, uh, if you couldn't get out of bed in the morning to go to work, They'd pick you up off the, off the, the in, in your bed and throw you in the ovens, alive. So I went down, I opened the, some of the ovens after that, and you seen shells, and, oh, you know, skulls, and oh, inside the oven. And they had a room, two room, one for, uh, if you wanted to take a shower, these people, you know, go in the room, instead of turning on the water, they turn on the gas, mm -hmm. kill them. They had another room about the size of this room here, and our operating table, we had a, a, a granite and had a slot right down the middle. We used to operate, and the, the blood on the floor was so thick you couldn't even walk on it. Mm -hmm. You cut a woman's breast off with no anesthetic, no nothing. Mm -hmm. They caught a guy, and he was telling me they cut this fellow, he was trying to escape, and he cut his knee off, his leg up to his knee. They cut him, mm -hmm. trying to escape. And all the wires around the compound were electrified. If you touched them, you could electrocute them. See? Mm -hmm. And these people, oh, they, were, they used to eat the heart and the liver out of the dead people to, to survive. Mm. See? One guy, I see one guy that was dead there, he was eating the kneecap of another guy. Mm. I mean, it's unbelievable. You, you wouldn't believe it. You had to see it to believe it. And I took those, I wasn't supposed to take those yeah. pictures, yeah. but I took them. Yeah. How so. many were, when you were there, how many were dead and how many were alive, would you say? Oh, there were. Well, the pictures I took now, there's right. a thousand people are dead right. in a pile, like, like right. a cord wooden, and there are not thousands more in the camp. Alive? Alive, right. you know, and when we liberated the camp, they 
bulldozer came, he dug a hole about 50 feet long and about six to seven feet deep. And they had all those civilians in the towns came in there to handle the dead people. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let, let us touch them, but the simple reason, once you touch a dead person, after he's rotted away, the smell is unbelievable, mm -hmm. see? So they had the civilians do it. Mm -hmm. That's I took the pictures, you know, right, right there. And it showed how, what happened, see? And you had to believe it to see it. Right. The people, it's unbelievable what they went through. God Almighty, it's something terrible. And I always said it. Get all those people to those concentrations again, regardless of who they were, send them back where they come from, and let them live for nothing mm -hmm. but what they went through. Mm -hmm. They deserve it. Mm -hmm. Give them everything they want. Give it to them. Because mm -hmm. you, 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 you couldn't believe what they went through. You had to see it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I took the pictures. I know I, I said, if I don't take these pictures, nobody's going to believe me. And I snuck them home, the negatives, and my brother had them blown up for me. Mm -hmm. But it was something awful, something awful. But like that was so, took our appetite away from us. Yeah. You know, it's, we're young. You've never seen that kind of stuff in your life. You know, oh, God, I might sound I wouldn't kill a dog, let alone a person. Mm -hmm. But you see all dead animals around every place, you know, every place you go in and walk, you know. And, hit by bullets and shells and bombs or whatever. And, and those are bad enough, you know, you know, horses and dogs and cows and cats, everything that killed, it's been the way. Well, it was, it was terrible, why was it a terrible thing? What are you gonna do? Look how many kids got killed during the war. Look at the Battle of the Bulge, how many soldiers got killed? Look about mm -hmm. thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers. But you had no choice, you had to go. What else could you do, mm -hmm. you know? You did the best you can. Where did you go after the camp? I went to Kemensee when the war ended. We had a party. Would you repeat that? Went to where? Kemensee, Germany. Okay. In a hospital. Mm -hmm. We had a party the night before for ice cream, and we left it in these containers. We had it the next day, and we all got tomate poison out of it. Oh. And we wound up in the hospital. Then from there, I went to Cherbourg. And I, they put me in the, the Yankee division, and I came home because I had enough points to get home. And then they had so many, so many points, you, they send you home. Mm -hmm. And I come home with this Yankee division. They <coughs> and went to, and then we get discharged, and I went home, and it was quite an experience. Are there any other combat experiences that I've failed to ask you about? No, that was it, from the Bell to the Rhine, and that was it. Did you do you remember any air support and any of that, uh, any of your wartime activities? Well, just when the American planes come on, they bombed it. Uh, you know, we, they dropped a lot of bombs on there. Yeah. In fact, they dropped the bombs on our over not in the area one day by mistake. Okay. <coughs> it was terrible. I mean, it's because there was a lot of offense in that, you know, in the, over in the above besides us. Yeah. But we were one of the ones that got there too. It's Christmas Eve and it's yeah. snow and rain. Oh my God. It was, Freezing. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little about the Battle of the Bulge, or a little more about it? Well, of course, when you're on the server, you don't know where you're going or what you're going to do, nothing. Right. So we wound up in Bastogne. When we got there, it was around Christmas Eve, and they said, geez, the 101st Airborne, the paratroopers mm -hmm. were trapped there. Right. So our outfit and our tanks and GIs, and, and they all went in to fight to get them out. Mm -hmm. And my job was, in the, I was in the service department, service outfit, and we had to supply all the guys in the front lines and mm -hmm. whatever they wanted, see? And besides other officers, you know, and it's, then we, it was terrible. I mean, dead bodies all over the place when it was all over, mm -hmm. after we liberated them, you know. No matter where you went, you see dead GIs and dead soldiers mm -hmm. and dead Germans as it's, it's well, they were trapped and uh, bombed and shelled and everything was going on. Mm -hmm. And it's, at midnight, say around midnight, they wouldn't let us light no cigarettes, no lights, no nothing. Because you'd see these German planes come flying over, these small cup planes coming over, over our area. And see, if anybody they have seen a light or a cigarette or something, a light, then they, they know where to bomb the area, see? And that's, at nighttime, it was, it was scary, because you couldn't do nothing. What could you do? You, you, you can't smoke, you can't light a fire, you can't do nothing. That was it, see? But it was, it was no picnic, but uh, like everybody else, they all went through, all the guys went through. It was, my younger brother got born, he got the back of his head shot off. Oh. 
he was a forward observer on the, in, uh, over there, and his lieutenant, he, he carried a radio on his back. And the lieutenant, you know, had, he, they, they went ahead of all the GIs to, so they can tell them where to bomb the, land the shells and all that there. And he got killed. My brother got lie. He had the whole back of his head shot off. He, he, I met him. In fact, when I was in England, he was a, they transferred to the hospital in England, and I didn't know this. And uh, I got a call that he was in Devizes, England, 25 miles away from me, in the hospital, wounded. And I never knew that, see, because oh. he seen that patch. I mean, we had an 11 diamond patch on our soul, and he got yeah. seen the patch in one of the hospitals, and he asked to get where we were located, and he told him, called me up. I wonder if I seen him. And we, you know, he got wounded bad, and uh, in fact, it was uh, Thanksgiving. I took him down my yard, we had Thanksgiving dinner together. <laughs> I took him back home, and then and then December we went over the riot. Over the, my older brother's up in Anzio. Mm -hmm. he, he, he got wounded also, and you know, well, well my poor mother was going crazy, you know. But that's, uh, hey, what are you going to do? Yeah. That's life. Could you tell me, uh, in the Battle of the Bulge, what the weather was like? Cold. Snow. Oh, oh I must have got him. Really, oh, snow about two or three feet deep. Yeah. We had to sleep in the holes, and we had to dig, you know, and where else could you sleep? And some of the guys, uh, you wake up, you're covered with snow in the hole. Oh. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was, you know, that's what happens. Do you feel that your officers gave you good leadership? Oh, yeah. We had good officers, yeah. Yeah, we had good officers, yeah. But they, what are you going to do? They told us what to do, and we did it, <laughs> period. That was it. And what were your greatest challenges when you were in combat? Uh, well, try to hide, you know, <laughs> if you can, get all the, oh, oh. it was, uh, what can you do? You, you're there and things happen, you, you pray, and it, what could you do? You know, we were shelled a few times, yeah, but hey, what are you going to do? Did you make good friends when you were overseas? Oh, yeah. Among your buddies? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you were, you were all nice guys. Yeah. I met a lot of people over there, you know, civilians, and. The kids, we gave the kids all, we had a rash, we gave the kids gum and cig nut cigarettes and sandwiches and things like that. The kids, you know, and we felt sorry for the Aww. kids. And we had some rations, we see, we all carried rations. And one couple of times we took them to these families and gave it to them to eat, you know. Oh, and, isn't that nice? Well, they went through, they, those family, people went through a hell of a yeah. Oh, God almighty. They, you wouldn't believe what those people went through. And you learn a lot, you learn a lot. But, did you get to hear about how the war was going in, in the Pacific, let's say, when you were in Europe? No, we didn't hear too much about what was going on. We were too busy ourselves to, you know, to worry about where, what else was happening, in the, yeah. you know. Because you hear all kinds of stories, but... We, I went up to see that had this Malmody Massacre. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. My friend and I, we went up the next day to see it, after it was over. Well, tell, tell us about it. We, too, we, heard, we heard about the Malmany Massacre. So this friend and I, we took a jeep one time. We went but up tell us what the Malmany Massacre, Massacre was. From what we understand, right. they had a bunch, hundreds of American GIs captured. Mm -hmm. And the Germans were there. They had them, you know, they had them on a big field. And the Germans came up, where well, they were there anyway. But they backed up their trucks, pulled up the curtains in the back of the truck, and the machine got them, mm -hmm. killed them all. Right. A few escaped. They were lucky, for we understand. Mm -hmm. But dead bodies, they never seen so many dead GIs in one field as in all my life. They, they called a Malibu Massacre. How many dead would you say were there? Oh, there were hundreds of them there. Oh, God, they and, never seen so many. And you were there the day after? Or? We were there the day after it happened. You know, the Germans left and left the double dead GIs there, see? And what did you do? Ugh, what could we do? We seen them, we looked at them. What else could we do? Mm -hmm. We were there. We seen yeah. it after, you know. it's. That's what happened. Mm. You know, the war is war, regardless of what you do. You know, yeah. you don't know what you're going to walk into. You don't know. See, mm. now, uh, see, uh, we, before you go to any town or during the war, if they had white curtains on the windows, that means there were no Germans in the town. Mm. But there was nothing on the windows or on the buildings. That means there were Germans in the town. So we were going through one town one time, and we are up on the hill looking down, and they were strafing and bombing the area because the Germans were in the town. And while we were watching up on the hill, we had some of the GIs in our tanks were falling over, dead. 
Coming up one day, we had, 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 had those Hitler youths up on the hill. Oh. 12, 13, 14 year old kids shooting at the GIs. And they were killing them. And we saw them, we caught them. Mm -hmm. Caught one of them. He must have been about 14, maybe 13, 14 years old. He's one of the guys, they used to shoot the Germans. The Germ they, used to, they used to shoot the GIs, mm -hmm. see? So we took him in this house we had, we stayed in, and we put his hands on the table like that. And one of the guys we were gonna make up, he was gonna cut off his fingers, right? Mm -hmm. And we looked at this kid, physically figure, and he was gonna scream and cry, and yeah, right? He didn't bat an eyelash. Didn't phase mm -hmm. him one single bit. Mm -hmm. When he seen what we were gonna do to him, we wanted to scare him. Right. He never moved an inch. Didn't say nothing. Just looked. Hey, you know, you know, he said, if you're gonna cut off your fingers, right. you, you're gonna scream and cry, and you know, did not. He was trained that way. Right. Okay. See, they were trained that way. A hit, you come to Hitler Youth. See, and the the SS troopers are the worst ones of the German army. They were the worst ones. They're the ones that went to. Like you go to West Point over here, they was those SS troopers trained different than the regular troopers, see? And they didn't see the, much of the combat that the regular people did. We had a, a German prisoner. He escaped from the Russian front to be captured by the Americans. Because the Russians didn't believe in taking prisoners. Oh. In fact, we met, uh, we met a Russian girl up in Bastogne, the Battle of the Boat, a big woman. She must have been about five or six feet tall. She must have been about 200 pounds with a machine. Let's choose a gorilla. Oh my God, we ever take a look at her. <laughs> It'll scare you. So uh, this kid was a young guy, and we could talk to him and all that baloney, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to put him in the, in, the, in the camp. And we met the Russians, and the Russians begged us, give me, give me, give me. They wanted the prisoner. Mm -hmm. We said, nah, nah, get out, get away from us. We got him, right? Begging us that he wanted that prisoner. Mm -hmm. A young guy. Go ahead, take him. We gave him to him. That was the biggest mistake we ever made in our life. Why? Oh, unbelievable. You talk about the Russians. Mm. Didn't like the German prisoners. Oh. Took him behind a barn, whacked him across the face with a board, oh. cut off his testicles, oh. stuck him in his mouth, oh. and left him there. Oh! I said, well, what's the matter with these people? Yeah. That's how they were, the Russians. They didn't, yeah. you know, they were, fought a war. They fought a war. They didn't care. They, I don't think they believed in taking prisoners anyway. That's how they were. And that was the end of that. He said, no more, he says. Oh, bad enough to, you know, the kid got captured. Because, mm. you know, th these Germans, they put them in these camps and they, and they treat them like they're prisoners, you know. Russians, I guess they don't believe in prisoners. They'd kill them. They didn't care. Oh, terrible. But, hey, that's war. What are you going to do? Yeah. Hmm? Do you feel that you were properly equipped to do what you had to do? Oh yeah, we had we had no problem. We had all the equipments we wanted. And oh. your weapons, uh, you weapons. Yeah. They were in fine. fact, we used to we used to, at nighttime when we were in, in training, we had to go in a room and it was dark and put the lights on. We had to take the gun apart and put it back again on the dock. In the event you were in battle or sometime, you didn't know how to. If your gun jammed or whatever happened, you knew what was wrong with you. You know, you'd take it apart. Mm -hmm. See, then we went through these gas chambers. Also, they took us. We go in these gas chambers. You know, walk through and get a taste of gas and all that stuff there, see? Well, we had good training. And then, then we had uh, about, we had wires about three feet off the ground, and we had to crawl under the wire while they shot with a machine gun bullets over our head in the event that you don't get up and look. You get hit in the head, see? That's the training. Well, we got a beautiful training, believe me. Could you explain the part about gas chambers? I didn't quite understand you. Well, they figured in, in the event that they were you, you captured, they were going to gas you. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know what, they wanted to tell you how you were going to go through it. Mm -hmm. So they put us in the gas chamber and they turned on the gas just enough so we could smell it and get out. Oh, okay. That was it. Okay. Gives you an idea. Right. See? It was, you know, that's what they trained us for. Mm -hmm. they, we, had, we had one of the best trainings you'd ever think. Mm -hmm. Believe me when I tell you. Yeah. Because what's, hey, what do you, they were pre. They were preparing you for combat in the event that you went. They're going to give you an idea what you're going to go through. And that was it. See? What could you do? Eh? They told us we did it, and that was it. I'm glad they did. 
Did you see any uh, uh, troops from other countries, our allies, like the British or the Canadians? No, we've seen the Russians. The Russians, okay. And some in English. In England. Yeah. What did you think of them? Uh, they're soldiers like everybody yeah. else. What are you going to do, huh? Yeah. Could you tell me, what would you, what would you say was your most memorable experience overseas? Well, I'll tell you. One, I see the concentration camp was one of them. Right. And that's something I'll never forget in my life. And during combat and the Battle of the Bulge and, and you know, all that stuff there, that's about all of it. In fact, it was, uh, one day I was over there in the Bulge, you know, went about 150 yards away, there were a bunch of trees there, about trees. And they had these mines all packed on top of one of these mines, these land mines, see? I was, I heard this great big explosion. Because the, the, it was frozen, see? Then I guess must have thawed out or something. And the whole thing went up about 150 feet in the air, flames, right? I see this great big thing coming flying towards me. A great big piece of meat. One of these guys got, must have been down there, he got shot and he blew him apart. Oh. He landed about 15, 20 yards in front of me. So I ran over to see what I was. One of the guy's butts oh. Oh. landed. Oh, Jesus, I says. He blown apart. Blown apart. Oh. Unbelievable. I mean, you see so many, oh. Every day is a different story. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> well, war is war. What are you going to do? I know. You know, it's, uh, we are young. And, of course, if we were older, if you were older, you know, then you just the a whole different story. But when you're young, hey. We went through it, we got trained for it, and we expected it, and we went in it. We went in it, and that was it. See? You just pray to God that you, you come out alive. That's the main thing. It's probably not an appropriate question to ask, but would you, was there any experience that you would call your most humorous experience over there? Uh, you mean during the war? Or yeah, anything that you look back on and say, that, that's got to have been a, a funny incident. Oh, before we went to the war, we yeah. we stayed in we stayed in France there on the way, and we went through the this little village and uh, meet all kinds of girls. Mm -hmm. Oh, everybody, you know, all the GI, read the GI, look for women. <laughs> what do you expect, for God's sake? <laughs> yeah, it, it was a it was a zone where all the prostitutes were. It's yeah. <laughs> one of those things. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> what are you gonna do? But to the you yeah you know. They say you read a book about different countries, you learn more by traveling mm -hmm. than you know and learn in a book. Because right. you're there, you see it, all the people. Now we had a stay, when, uh, while we were over in Europe, we had to stay in these houses and we took off some of the houses. We had to live in the houses. And uh, every day, the people used to own the house, they couldn't buy with a bucket of water and soap, wash the sidewalks. Wow. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. And if a horse was going down the street, he made a mess in the head, shoveled it right up all yeah. the time, see? And then we had roadblocks in every, at the end of every town. And every time, he had to, every vehicle had to stop and check them out to make sure it was, you know, GI, see? And uh, I'll tell you one thing, the black fellas had a better time than we did. <laughs> Why is that? See? Oh, I'll tell you. They had all their women yeah. in England, France, Germany, more than we did. Because they all worked in quartermaster. They all what? Worked for the quartermaster. Yeah. Supplies. Oh. And they had all the supplies they wanted. Oh. You know <laughs> We had a bar of chocolate. We'd get a girl, here in a bar of chocolate, come with me. <laughs> He'd give him five bucks. And all the girls loved them for the simple reason. They got right. more than what we get. Right. It was only natural during the war, you know. Yeah. And, well, they had it made over there, but we want to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> now, how did you, did you have a chance to uh, socialize with black soldiers? Do you remember? No, we've seen a few still of them. But were you still probably segregated? Oh, well, they were, see, they had their own camps. Right. We had our own camps. Yeah. You meet them in town, yeah. different places. Because yeah. down south, they had a tough down south in them days. Yeah. Because the southern people didn't care for blacks. Right. See, not like it is today. They, they had their own places to go. If you got on a bus, the back seat was full, and that, they wouldn't stop and pick you up, yeah. you know. And they had their own bathrooms, their own place they had to go into. It's a whole different ball game in them days. The black, they went through hell. I'll tell these black people did, but down mm -hmm. south. They, today it's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. they, but in them days, it was tough. 
They had their own camp. See? And we had our own camp. And the wax had their own camp. Right. Today, everything you buy, everything you buy is mixed <laughs> together. Women, men, uh. <laughs> see? And they all get the same uniforms. Those, those, those are camouflage uniforms. They, we had them in them days. Yeah. When you're in a car battle, that's where they, they gave those camouflage uniforms. Because we had our own clothes, you know, during the war. Dr the khakis in the summertime and the dress uniforms in the, you know, in the wintertime was beautiful. No, it was yeah. nice. Not today. They, they, they're walking around like, huh. And it's a lot different. The service today is a heck of a lot different than we were. If you get killed in the service, you, you had an insurance of ten thousand dollars. Your folks got. Today, I understand it's two hundred and fifty thousand mm. dollars. See, and everything was changed. Now they go to school, they get fifty thousand dollars for going to college, don't they? Huh? A lot. Mm. They get a lot of money. See, you know, being in the service today is a good deal today. Mm. They make big money. We were getting fifty bucks a month. <laughs> that was a lot of money. I was sending home thirty-five dollars a month. I was sending home <laughs> fifty bucks a month. Like I used to work over and eat them in, in the knitting place. I'm making twelve bucks a week. <laughs> we were getting fifty bucks a month. Oh, that's a lot of money, you know, yeah. compared to the them days. But today, these GIs today, I understand they can live off the base if they want to, get their own apartments. Oh, what a life they got! It's one of the best deals <laughs> in the world. I mean, the kid they're draining the service, he's crazy. Yeah. Go to college free. What more do you want? How can you beat it? <laughs> you know, it's it's a whole different ball. Because things change. What do you know? What do you mean? Could but you tell me about your trip home from Europe to the United States? Did you go by boat? We went by boat. Yeah. And what was that trip like? Oh, you couldn't even move. Oh. Had so many GIs in one boat. Oh, it was one of those English boats. You know, uh, you know, you you were in like sardines. Do you know what kind of boat it was? Uh, oh, I forget what it oh, was. Okay. Uh, it wasn't a great big, big yeah. boat. <coughs> <coughs> but uh, <coughs> we were in England. I went down to the wharf when I was in England one time, and the Queen Mary was parked there. Yeah. And that was an enormous boat. Mm -hmm. Remember them days, the Queen Mary? Yes. Huh? Yeah. But we went in these small bo troop boats mm -hmm. over here in the middle of the ocean. Scary. <laughs> Believe me, we came home and we we were over in the I don't know, I forget the place over here in, in the ocean, and we had a, we hit a storm. <sighs> Scared the living oh. daylights out away. They had a big storm they had in the ocean. What port? Scary. What port did you pull into? <coughs> I'm trying to think the name of the port. Is there a Oh, jeez, I had the tip of my tongue, too. So I was going to ask if you saw the Statue of Liberty in New York, if they took you past that, but I guess not. No, you didn't no, go to New York. No, yeah. no, no. Norfolk, maybe? Norfolk, Virginia? Yeah, we were through, yeah I think we were to Norfolk, yeah, Virginia, yeah. and then from there we would okay. cross the, the country to mm -hmm. California. And we did a lot of traveling. I mean, yeah. we, I, mean I, I never left Massachusetts like a <laughs> drafter, for God's yeah. sakes. You read about all these different places, you know. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Now, when, when and where were you discharged? Camp Devons. Yeah. And yeah. when was that? Uh, 19, January 7, 1946, mm -hmm. I think it was. And how did you feel on being discharged? Yeah. You were home. It was a whole yeah. different ball game. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. great to be home, yeah. alive, and see your family again and your friends. You know, because yeah. uh, a few of my friends, they, they get killed. Yeah. And I thought, before I went into service, I talked to this friend of mine, one of my neighbors. He's about 17, 18 years old. He's like, I'm going to join the Marines. I'm going to join the Marines. I says, what do you want to join the Marines for? Oh, I love the uniform. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Classy uniform out there. I said, let me tell you this. Don't join nothing. Wait till you get dressed. Oh, no, I got to go. I got to go. So he went. Yeah. He got killed in Tarawa oh. in the landing. Oh. He got killed. Oh, I'll never forget that. Jeez, I'm begging this. Don't, don't. Of course, in them days, when you're a soldier, a GI, hey, everybody yeah. looked up to you. You know what I mean? What was your homecoming like? How did your friends and family treat you when you came home? Oh, well, my mother and father were so happy, and all my friends and cousins and uncles and aunts, oh, big deal, oh, happy. And they gave us money and treated us like we were, like we were God, I guess. Yeah. But that, 
course, in them days, a whole different ball game, you know. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. How important was for you was serving in the military? Well, I'll do this right here. In fact, when I was doing basic training in Camp Polk, Louisiana, my left leg gave me a lot of problems. I had blisters all over my, and they wanted to discharge me. And I says, no, I'm staying in the Army. But uh, I'll leave it this right here. If they draft you in the Army, go. It's your duty to go. It's your country to go. Right. And that was it. And I'm glad, you know, I, I wasn't glad I got drafted, but I was happy that I got drafted because my brother went first, and me, and then my other brother, and all my friends went there, and one by one, they were all disappearing, you know, being drafted on the shirts. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be home. I didn't want to be called up for ref, you know, and, but I was happy. I mean, I enjoyed it, believe me. It's quite an experience, quite an experience. Because when you're young, you know, and uh, when I first got drafted on basic training, and, you know, you don't tell me what they're doing all the time, you know, you think, hey, my, Sergeant got me one day, I refused to do something. He says, you got to do it. Put me on KP for a week. <laughs> and I mean, you learned. <laughs> you learn. And the training they give you, they're the boss, not you. They're the boss. They tell you when to walk, how to walk, where to walk, when to sleep, when to go to bed, when to get up. Your body don't belong to you. They tell you everything, and you better pay attention, because if you don't, you are looking for trouble. Well, how do you think the uh, serving in the army affected the rest of your life? It taught me a lot. Yeah. It taught you, you learn a lot. Believe me, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. You learn about people, mm -hmm. how they live, what they do, all about traveling. You, you you really learn. Like I said, you learn more by traveling and going every place than you do by reading. Mm -hmm. See, and that's quite an experience. See, mm -hmm. that's it. It's every state. Every town, every country is different. So like Matt, you live come from Massachusetts, New York, California, different than us. You know, everything is different. It's a whole different ballgame, no matter what you do. Right? But you learn a lot. It's quite an experience, and because uh, when you're young, you enjoy it. Yeah. You can afford it, but you you can enjoy it. It's good. You mentioned that you received a good homecoming. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you feel about the difference in homecoming you received uh, versus the Vietnam veterans and the type of homecoming they received. Well, in the first place, that war was useless to begin with, mm. my opinion, mm. see? And those guys, what they went through, they should never have gone to uh, what they did, the Vietnam war or the other war they had to. It's, it's, I, I can't understand it. This country here, and then this country is, is the biggest fool in the, in the world of this country. Is they, they don't stop and realize what these GIs went through. They go over and they visit them now, they go to China, they go to Japan. Look at Japan, they bomb, they bomb Pearl Harbor, mm. right? Now they own us. I mean, where do you draw the line? Yeah. Like God says, come on, how many GIs get killed over there? And these, they go, go over there and visit them and help them. To, uh, leave them where they are, they don't bother them at all mm. for what they did to us. Look at all the GIs we get, get killed in that kind of, look at, look at the woman, the five Sullivan brothers, I'll never forget them. They all got killed together in a boat, which they changed the rules now, you can't, two people can't go together, you know, right. in the same offer. That mother was too crazy. I mean, come on, for God's sakes. Mm. They praise those people, Lord. let them stay where they are. Now they come and go here and they own this country. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I forget, I've, I've, I've discussed it, but I'm telling you this. It isn't right. May I ask you, did you join the reserves when you returned? No, I did not. Okay. No. Yeah, or any veterans organizations? I belonged to the VFW. Yeah. And need them. I yeah. belonged to them. All my friends. And did you them. ever take advantage of veterans' benefits, uh, as going to school or the GI Bill or insurance? No, I didn't. Yeah. I tried to go to college when I come out through the GI Bill, and uh, you had to be a disabled veteran at the time. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And I wasn't disabled at the time, yeah. but I did get a disability later on. Yeah. But that time I was forget yeah. it. Yeah. And them days was a whole different ball game them days. Yeah. They, they had all these rules and rec oh, please. Today it's different. I'll look at the different today. Yeah. But hey, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Is there a, a one thought or memory you'd like to share with people watching 
uh, this tape about something you'd like to pass on to them? Well, like I made a tape for the, two years ago for all the kids in school. The trouble today is, today it's all the different than the day we were, we were growing up. When we were growing up, everybody was friendly with everybody. Mm -hmm. See, today it's a whole different ball game today. Especially these kids. These kids today, what they should do, in my opinion, they come out of the high school or whatever, put them in the army for a year, mm. straighten them out, learn them. Today, these kids don't care for nothing. If you're a WAP, they call you a WAP. They call you a Guinea. They call you an Irish. They call you everybody. All the national, they don't get along anymore today mm. like they used to. Yeah. They don't do it. Today, it's wrong. Yeah. See? In them days, we were growing up, everybody was friendly. The Jews, the Irish, the blacks, because we never had a problem. You know, we all got friendly. Today it's a whole different ball game. Mm. You can't do nothing. Oh, because you're a Puerto Rican, because you're black, because you. Yeah. That's all you're here today. Right. They, it's wrong. They shouldn't do that. Yeah. Learn to get together again. What's the matter with you people today? You see? Now the farms are coming over here. Oh, there's a big snake about them. Now they want this, they want that. <laughs> the whole country's going to hell, mm. believe me. It's, it's, it's not right. It's not right. Is there anything uh, else that you'd like to mention that I haven't uh, asked you about that you'd like to leave as your parting words for this uh, wonderful videotape? Well, I'll say one thing. People today should get together and learn to stay and respect each other. When we were growing up, not only me, our family, every other family growing up, we never locked our doors during the day or at night or anything like that, right? And we never, he never had a key to my house, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was the same way. Today, you don't know what's going to happen. Right? No, these kids, they, they don't want to work unless they get big, big bucks. That's where they are. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Learn to live with each other, regardless, no matter what they are. Learn. Get along with people. Never mind this baloney. Because mm -hmm. I'm here, I'm there, and I'm this, and one of those. That, 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 it isn't worth it. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I'd like to end the interview and thank you very oh, much. Oh, I'm so it was happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Like I met the doctor with the kids in the schools too.